Blue Ridge Parkway. It was crazy cool. Um, did drive in the rain a couple of days. Um, could have lived without that, but the four days we were on the Blue Ridge Parkway were, it was beautiful weather, 70s. Um, and this is actually the slow time of year for the parkway. So there were very few other cars on there. And it was, um, doesn't have to be on a motorcycle. If you're in a car, if you're on a motorcycle, whatever, and you're looking for a really cool curvy road in the mountains to do, Blue Ridge Parkway is amazing. 470 miles end to end, we did the whole thing. So that, and then um, just to tell you, you know, to get this on your radar, to look for it for next year, last weekend, I uh, just came back from Catskill Mountains Maker Camp. You can Google that. This is the second time I've been. The first one was two years ago. And um, I, I loosely describe this as um, a woodworking event meets Woodstock. It's, uh, and it's way more than just woodworking. I was teaching CNC. There are people doing welding, foundry, casting pewter, blowing glass, timber frame construction. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else is going on. So it's just, it's like anything that's hands-on is happening at this event over the three or four day period of the event. It's, so it's crazy cool that um, it's on a huge ground, it's at a resort and everybody's just walking around from tent to tent, experiencing whatever they wanna experience. Um, when the event closes at the end of the day, everybody hangs out. We all had supper together, presenters and attendees. Uh, and it's in a beautiful part of the country. It's a little bit outside of Albany, New York. It's about a 50 minute drive out of Albany, New York in the Catskills, just a crazy beautiful part of the world. So it'll be a year from now, it's gonna be that same weekend again, somewhere around October 10th. If this piques your interest at all, Google it, look it up and um, get it, like I said, get it on your radar, get it on your calendar for next year. It was, um, it, it's just, it's a really, really, really neat, um, it's a really, really neat way to present information. Very, very, very fun. Okay, so now, woodworking related questions. Richard says, can you address shop organization and tool use from the seated position? Very large question, I know. Maybe address one response each over two or three live events. Woodworking from a seated position. Boy, I don't know. I don't think I'm the guy for this because I, I get in my shop and I never sit down. I mean, even... Um, I've had this conversation with a few other woodworkers, like even when I'm sanding for extended periods, I'm not on a stool. I'm, I'm every minute I'm working in my shop, I'm on my feet. So there are probably creative solutions for this, but I don't know of any, cause I don't, it's just not in my, uh, it's not in the way, it's not the way I do woodworking. Like I said, I'm, I'm on my feet all the time. I don't know, I'll stew on it. And if I can come up with something for subsequent lives, I'll throw it out there. But um, there are probably better resources than me for this. Sean says, having a hard time getting an eighth inch blade to track properly on my 10 inch bandsaw. It's a brand new blade and will fall off uh, fall off the front or back, depending on the slightest tracking knob adjustments. I can get the blade to stabilize, but as soon as I lock the trapping, tracking knob, it moves. Do I let the blade ride on the thrust bearing? What am I doing wrong? All right, so I, I saw this question ahead of time when I was looking to see if there were questions. So I do have a bench top bandsaw in my shop. So I brought it over here so we can have a look. So here's, let's just talk bandsaws in general because this is, um, this, there's some commonalities here to any bandsaw. When we have a look inside, and of course the saw is unplugged for what I'm doing here, tracking, what we're talking about is that when I turn this by hand, there is 
a tracking knob on the back of the saw. So on this one, it's right there. And this is very intuitive. It's very, it, it works the way it looks, which is when I righty tighty, when I turn it clockwise, it's tightening. And what that does is it makes that tracking knob go in, which pushes the bottom of the wheel out. If I loosen it, if I back that tracking knob out, the bottom of the wheel has the opportunity to go in. So the effect on your bandsaw blade is that then when I spin this by hand, if I turn that tracking knob, I just backed it out, that would cause the blade to move forward. There it's doing it. And if I turn it the other way, if I tighten it, that would cause the blade to move deeper into the saw. And what we're after when you set this, and again, bench top or, or floor model, what we're after is in the absence of any other means of support, we should be able to spin this by hand and the blade should stay right in that middle of the tire. Um, un, un, I mean, there are qualifiers, there, there are qualifiers to where you track the blade, depending on how big your bandsaw is. But the bottom line is we should be able to stabilize the blade position on the tire just the way this one is doing right now. So part of that question was, should I use the thrust bearing? And I'm guessing the end of that question is, should I use the thrust bearing to hold the blade in place? And the answer is no, because to get the saw, to get any saw to work its best, we want this in just an equilibrium position. We want the blade in that equilibrium position where um, as I'm spinning this, like I said, in the absence of any other support, it stays right where it is. So what I don't get with your particular saw is, you said when you lock the tracking knob, it shifts. Um, so I think what might be happening is that when you turn the lock, and I'm guessing maybe the approach for that, I've seen it on some bandsaws, this is just a piece of threaded rod right there. So sometimes there's a big wing nut, and when you, when you wanna lock that position, you turn the wing nut. So I think what's probably happening is that when you turn the wing nut, it's also turning that piece of rod, that thread, that's causing that to go in, which would kick the bottom of the wheel out, which would cause the blade to probably fall off the back of the wheel. So one thing I would try to start with is hold this knob in place while you're tightening that nut with the other hand so that this position stays and the tightening of whatever the locking device is, doesn't change it. And that's that's the way, that's the approach that you want to take. If, if you can get this to spin, if you can get it to track okay, right up to the point where you're locking that tracking knob, then hold the tracking knob as you're doing the locking and hopefully that'll resolve that for you. But you don't want to, you really don't want to lean on, um, on trying to use the thrust bearing to solve that problem. That's, it's, it's not really gonna solve the problem and you're like treating the solution, not or you're, you're treating a symptom, not the problem. So best bet is to get it to track correctly. That's the first thing I would try is two hand lock setup. Uh, when using a heat gun to remove bubbles from resin, what's a good temperature for the heat gun? Um, I don't know. Let me see. Let me grab the gun I commonly use. This is a, this is a Wagner. So what I was looking for, what I thought maybe it would give me is its range. which it doesn't. So I don't know, because honestly all I do is I, I turn this heat gun on high and I blow the bubbles. So what temperature it's kicking out, if you want to, if you want to Google that information, I'm looking for a model number. All right, if you want to Google that information, this is a Wagner 050, Three six five five. And like I said, I, I put it on the high setting. Psh, I blow it at the epoxy. Whatever it's doing, it's doing fine for me. 
So maybe if you find specs on that gun, it'll tell you what the high setting heat range is, and that'll help you with yours. Uh, Andy says, in one of your videos, you put a 12 by 12 tile in the top of a side table. It looked to me like you put the edge of the rail up to the side of the tile to mark for the size of the tile to cut the miter. I didn't notice you adjusting for the ledge the tile would sit on. Wouldn't cutting the miter to the mark from the edge of the tile allow the tile to fall through? Yes. And I think that project was shot in my old shop. And I've been in this shop, what year are we in? Almost 10 years, um, which means that project was done a really, really, really long time ago. However, um, I think that, I think the way that that project was done was I made rails and one step further, I think, aren't the rails black on that? They're, um, either stained black or they're iron oxided black. Um, but anyway, um, then I think I added, I feel like I added a batten to the bottom of the rail or the inside edge of the rail to create the ledge, the rabbit that the tile sits on. Because I think what happened is, well, yeah, and it would show in the video. I mean, right? Um, but I think, I feel like the way that got finished is, the frame all gets put together, went upside down on a bench with the tile in it. Then the ledge strip got added after, and that got everything flush across the top, the tile and the wood frame. But if you watch the video in there somewhere, it's going to show how the tile is held in place, and that'll get you there. Um, so back to the pumpkin tray. Katie has put the pumpkin tray link right there in the chat roll where y'all are asking your questions. So you can, that makes it easy for you. You can click on that link and get to that very readily. Uh, best finish for a wood item exposed briefly to high temperatures during its use. Wow. Great question. Um, Can you hear him finally finishing the road out in front of the shop? There's some big truck is backing up. Um, so in the world of paint, I know that there are temperature resistant paints. I don't know in the world of clear coats, this would take more research than I, this is an answer I don't think I can give you. Um, I think you'd have to, you'd really have to do some research and ask manufacturers and you're going to want to know not just high temperature, but, you know, is high temperature 100 degrees or 200 degrees? Um, and go from there. Um, it would be interesting to explore. I know people have put automotive clear coats on woodworking projects. And I would think, because cars sit in the sun, clear coats are capable of withstanding not just high temperatures, but temperature extremes. So that might be a choice. That might be a good option. But yeah, I don't know. It's, you're going to have to do some research um, to, to get more specific numbers, more specific data on that. Walter asks, uh, and Walt was at the Makers event, at Makers Camp, um, panel saw versus track saw. Yes, is my answer. I don't know. That's a, that's a hard one. Um, Track saw has the benefit of being portable. So if you need to take it from your shop, that's easy to do. Not every panel saw offers that. Um, panel saw is probably offers you more, probably offers you more repeatability um, where you can set a stop on a panel saw, slide a four by eight in there, make a cut, slide the four by eight, make a cut, slide the four by eight, where with a track saw, you're gonna measure, make a mark, position the track, make a cut, measure, make a mark, position the track, make a cut. So in a, in the repeatability world, a panel saw kind of sneaks up more on what a table saw provides. Table saw by virtue of having a rip fence and a miter gauge, panel saw by virtue of having stops and a fence and everything else. Um, but um, 
battery operated track saws are pretty cool and offer a lot of um, offer a lot of benefits. So it's it's kind of an apples to oranges thing. I think I'm happy to spend your money, so get both, and uh, then you're covered either way. Um, panel saw, you also got to be willing to give up a footprint someplace. It's going to sit wherever in your garage, in your shop, um, and take up space. So that's that would be another consideration. Track saws really don't take up space. Sherry asks the best way to finish and in parentheses, water protect, a bathroom vanity, lacquer, question mark. Also, what do I do if the open legs of said vanity don't sit against the wall because the wall isn't square? So the open legs, so let's do the finish part first. Um, regular, standard, everyday cellulose lacquer does not have a lot of water resistance. So um, if you're in a, environment where it's going to be very damp all the time or you're worried about like the vanity is so close to a shower or something water is going to commonly get splashed on the side of the vanity standard everyday lacquer is not going to be a great choice for that um, catalyzed lacquer would be a great choice the properties of catalyzed lacquer which catalyzed lacquer is not going to come from a home center it's going to come from a more specialized store like Hirschfields or Sherwin Williams, a more specialized finishing store. Catalyzed lacquer, when it's cured, sneaks up on the durability really of polyurethane. So the benefits of handling like a lacquer, big benefit is it dries really, really fast um, with the protective nature of um, polyurethane. Um, you want to be real careful working with catalyzed lacquer. Uh, the fumes that come off of it, you definitely want to have a mask. You want to have good ventilation. Um, it's, it's in that regard, it's dicey to work with. So an alternative to that would be a polyurethane, very highly protective finishes. One of the things I don't care for about polyurethane is the flash time on lacquer can be, maybe it's only 10 minutes where the flash time on your polyurethane is maybe 50 minutes or an hour. So if you're not in a spray booth, if you're in an environment where like dust mites and stuff can still be trickling out of the air, that stuff can land in that polyurethane for a really long time. And then you're gonna have dust nibs in there that you have to worry about cleaning up. So um, catalyzed lacquer or polyurethane would give you great protection. Now, open legs of the vanity don't sit against the wall because the wall isn't square. I don't. I don't have a picture in my head of the legs sitting against the wall. Um, I don't know what you mean by that. But, I mean, if you make a piece of furniture, whatever it is, and it sits on the floor here and it looks like it's tilting away from the wall because the wall's out of plumb, then you're, you either have to shim the legs of the furniture if you want it to look like it's parallel or up against the wall, or you have to live with the gapicity and let it look like the leaning tower of Pisa. You know, I mean, it's it's one of those two things is plumb, one of those two things is square to the floor, um, and you're either gonna you're not gonna change the wall, so you either have to shim the vanity to make it look right, um, or live with the gap it's creating. Over the years, I've had a heck of a time getting a good edge on scraping cards. Do you use scrapers? And if yes, do you have a particular sharpening technique that works? I do. So um, let me, I'm going to give this moments of time because then I'm going to take you in another direction. But I can, I'll kind of talk people through where we're going here. Just got to open the right drawer. So, if you're not aware, card scrapers are about as hard as a handsaw blade. And the way they work is that it looks like just a little rectangular piece of steel, but in order to get this to cut, you're actually mushrooming one edge. And by mushrooming that, by deforming it, we're pushing the metal down over the side like this to create a hook. 
So it's the same effect as if you have a metal chisel, if you have a cold chisel, and that's been hit with a two pound hammer over and over and over again, then the end of that chisel mushrooms, it deforms. Small scale, that's what we're doing here. The way that that happens is you use a burnisher and that burnisher simply gets rubbed. We don't pound on this. It simply gets rubbed across there. And by rubbing that across there with a little oomph, we deform that edge so that it generates a burr and um, that's where the burr comes from. So the specific technique, um, there, there are multiple steps involved here. One thing that's really important is that if this has been, if you've tried to do this a bunch of times unsuccessfully, or if you have an older card scraper, you probably need to clean up the edge. You need to joint the edge, not on your jointer. Anytime you straighten an edge, you're jointing an edge. That's done with a file followed by a whetstone. Once you get to that point and you've got a good edge, then you're ready to go to the burnisher. So all of this has been laid out. If you, on WWGOA.com, if you go to the search window and you just search scraper, um, I've done video content that shows how to sharpen a scraper. Uh, we've done it as a live stream a couple times. So the, the reason I'm not going step by step now is because I know that the information is already out there on the interwebs. Um, but there are, there, it's a recipe. And a really, really important part of that recipe is make sure you're starting with the good edge. If the edge is already kind of deformed, you're, um, you're starting at a huge disadvantage and it's going to be really difficult to get it burnished, to get it sharp. Um, Roger says, I want to make veneer from the same wood as turnings to get some translucent parts for related parts for lamps and lighting. Any suggestions for making the veneer? Yeah, it's generally making veneer is a resaw operation, so bandsaw. And um, I generally resaw my veneer to about three thirty seconds of an inch thick. And then the easiest way to clean it up is on a drum sander, surface sander. I've got a super max sander. So once the veneer has been cut on the bandsaw, uh, slightly oversized, then you can wrap it up on a drum sander. And really, you know, if, if you don't own a drum sander, I would find a place you can use one or borrow one because that a drum sander allows you to make wood paper thin. And I think for something like a lamp shade, for something like a lamp shade, um, that sander would be hugely beneficial for you to really get it. You know, you could, you could literally be sanding, hold it up to the light, sand, hold it up to the light until you get it the, the level of translucence that you want. Uh, so Clint says he's got the same heat gun as I, and it is 300 on low, 1200 on high. So what we've learned is that I didn't know it, but I'm working epoxy with my heat gun on 1200 um, degrees. Ryan says, best selling woodworking item to get a side business off the ground. Yes. So the, I, uh, you know, say it's, um, it's going to depend on uh, what tools you have, what skills you have, what wood you can get. And then of course, what people in your area are willing to buy. Um, lots and you know, the good news is a lot of people start with cutting boards. The bad news is a lot of people start with cutting boards. You can buy cutting boards at Ikea all day, every day. So you're competing with, with a company, not just Ikea, but lots of kitchen companies who are capable of mass producing these things by the 11 billions. Um, that being said, um, I talked to a guy at the Catskill Maker Camp this weekend who um, he said he paid for his shop by making cutting boards. Um, so that's gonna depend on where you live, where you can market them. But um, what I would really do is talk to people. So just ask people, if you were making a wooden item, what would they be looking for? We talk in kitchen items, storage items, shop items, and then from there start to winnow it down and match it to your skill set, your tool set, lumber that's available for you. And um, you really got to reverse engineer it based on marketing. So. Um, you know, and I think it's the same with everything. It's, it's, uh, I don't know, McDonald's doesn't 
make a new hamburger because Ray Crack says, I bet everybody would like fish burgers. Um, McDonald's makes a new hamburger because they do market analysis and they survey people and say, what would you like to see next from McDonald's? So um, that would be, um, you, you know, you could do, it's, it's the right time of year to start walking through craft shows because Christmas is right around the corner. So craft shows will be prevalent. And if you just watch what other woodworkers are selling and what it looks like people are commonly buying from other woodworkers, that would also be a great way to just um, do a little kind of on the sly market analysis. Charles says, how important is a glue gun for the shop? You know, I've got one or two. I use them. I don't use them every day. It's so inex they're so inexpensive. I would get one. And then if you need it, you got it. And if you don't need it, it's not, I mean, I can't, I don't think a heat gun or a glue gun costs 20 bucks, does it? I don't know. Um, I use it in some of my epoxy work to create dams when I'm about to fill something and I want to overfill it slightly. You can make a berm with hot glue around it so you have room to overfill without flooding the whole surface. Uh, temporarily sticking parts together, of course. So, yeah, they're handy to have. Uh, Lyle says, best style of track saw for a low budget. Um, I have not, what you really need, what you're looking for there is a tool test of track saws. And um, we, WWGOA, does not do, we don't do tool tests. Um, so I would Google track saw tool test. And what's cool with that is you might find stuff that's not necessarily just in the woodworking market, but also the construction market uses track saws too. And then you could match it up by how much do I want to spend? Typically in a, in a tool test, they'll say, this is the best one, regardless of price. You know, if price is not an object, this is the best one. And then um, often there's like an editor's choice, which is uh, for the money, this is a good one too. But that's that would be your best way to look at that and get objective opinions from a publication that does tool tests. Jeff says, for a 13 inch bench planer, is a dual feed speed worth the additional expense? If so, what is the advantage? Yeah, so I, I had uh, for a long time, the DeWalt 735, which is a two-speed planer. And I currently have a big stationary planer, which has variable speed on the feed. And that's not uncommon for large stationary planers. So the deal with that is it comes down to um, cuts per minute that we can produce on a board. So what happens, planers generally feed at their standard speed, they feed at about 20 feet per minute, 20 lineal feet per minute. So, that works okay for a lot of materials, but when you get to something that's a little dicey and pretty, like birch in general, specifically flame birch, um, bird's eye maple or, or maple in general, maybe curly maple, what can happen is that wood, wood has a grain direction, of course, and the way to think about this is like, if we can, if we can see the grain direction, and we can machine the wood in the right direction. So I'm simulating that with my fingers. If we can machine the wood in the right direction where the grain lays down as we cut it, that's gonna give us the best cut. What happens in really highly figured wood is that a lot of times the grain contradicts itself. So when we have a cool, a cool curl, a lot of times some of the grains go in this way, some of the grains go in this way. So when it hits that opposing grain, it can lift it and cause it to chip. One of the benefits to being able to slow down the feed rate is that we get more cuts per minute. And as a result, it really, really, really can reduce the tear out that we get in those more highly figured woods. So um, it's something that the variable speed on this planer, the, the slower speed on my 735, I don't use, I didn't use every day, but when you get to that expensive, highly figured piece, it's really nice to have that slower speed in your back pocket to be able to really optimize the um, optimize the surface finish of the material. Not too long ago, uh, part of our product showcase, one of the products that we had was Rikon's two-speed planer. And I, in that product showcase, I specifically run material through at the normal rate, and I specifically run it through at the slower rate 
and show you the difference between the two. And there is a visible difference. So um, go back and look at that video from the product showcase, which was only maybe a month or two ago. You'll be able to find it. And um, that'll give you a good visual on that. Herb says, I built a dining table and used epoxy on the tabletop. I've read different opinions that you should use polyurethane over the top of the epoxy since food will be served on the table. Will the polyurethane bond to the epoxy? Thoughts? So there's a lot going on here. Um, what I would do is ask the manufacturer of your particular epoxy two things. One, is the epoxy in its form food safe when it's cured? Now, in its form means if all you did is mix it and you poured it clear, then you have the native product that came out of the bottle that's on your tabletop. You need to tell them if, did you mix in mica powder? Did you mix in pigment? Did you mix in brass flakes? Did you mix anything into it so it's no longer in its native state? Now it's got this other stuff in it. Is it food safe when it's fully cured? If that answer is no, then the next question is still for them, which is, will polyurethane stick to the top of it? Most likely they're going to say you need to abrade the entire surface and then you can coat over it. So in this corner of my shop, I've been working on a cedar strip canoe for quite a while. And the last step of that is that um, the, the epoxy gets sanded and then that gets varnished. And it's not a food safe issue, it's a UV light issue. Because obviously the canoe is gonna live outside. If you, don't, um, if you don't treat that epoxy, then it can, the UV can degrade it. So I'm using, I use the Total Boat High Performance product on the canoe. I'm then using a Total Boat sealer um, varnish over the epoxy. So those two, obviously they came from the man, same manufacturer. I know they play nice together. I do know I need to sand the epoxy before I put that sealer on, the varnish on. So um, the best answer to this question is gonna come from the manufacturer of your particular epoxy to make sure you don't run into a compatibility issue and, and do you need to do it at all. Um, Anisha asks, my kids sat fast on a wooden chair and the back got a fracture at the bottom joint how should I repair? Uh, there, there are there are a lot of it depends here. I'm not a huge re, um, refinishing furniture repair guy, so I'm sure there are people out there with way better answers. And then it it depends so much on the type of break, the type of chair, the type of wood. So I would look for your your best bet would be to look for a forum that's not about building new like we are at WWGOA, but more about furniture repair, furniture refinishing, that kind of thing. And then it would be very helpful if they would let you, if they had a facility to let you post a picture of the problem, of the break, and then somebody could provide you really good suggestions for glue is gonna take care of it, or you gotta add a dowel, or maybe it's not fixable at all, I don't know. But um, there, there are way too many, it depends to just answer off a question. And then two, I am not a good resource at any way for providing an answer for it. Um, I want to, if you came in late, you missed, um, Halloween's right around the corner and we've got a project set up for that. It's a very cool little pumpkin tray. And um, in the chat roll here on www.goa.com, Katie has put the link for that in the chat roll. And then additionally, if you just look for this banner right there, right there, it says download now. And if you click that, there's a picture of the pumpkin tray. You can grab that. Um, you can grab the plan for that pumpkin tray. And it's cool. Our timeliness is such that our timing is such that there's still plenty of time to get that done and have it in your house for Halloween. Joel asks. I just finished gluing up about 20 raised panels for cabinets out of cherry. I have air dried for 12 years. I have about 40 or so three to four inch wide by three quarter inch boards, 30 inches long, two bowed to use. 
I can't flatten them by conventional means as they would be less than three quarter inch thick. Could I glue the opposing faces together to make usable face usable pieces, then remill them instead of making firewood out of them? So I think what you're, I think where you're going with this is glue the opposing flat faces together. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're if you're talking about flattening two faces, glue those together, plane that to then whatever thickness you want you should be okay. If you're saying like, I'm going to exaggerate, this is bowed and this is bowed. And if I put enough glue and clamp pressure, I can force them together. My hands won't force together, but I could force those faces together. That's a bad idea. You never, it's never a good solution to um, just clamp the heck out of something and then, um, hope that that's going to stand up to the test of time because you're introducing so much tension to that. So if you can take those bowed or twisted or warpified pieces, get one face flat, one face flat, put two perfectly flat faces together and then do whatever you want with that, then you'll be fine. Which nail gun would be most used when doing woodworking? Pin, brad, staple, etc. cetera. Um, I can send you home with a note because you need to get one of each. So um, there isn't really, there isn't really a single prevalent type of nail gun that's gonna, that's gonna be a dual. So as an example, um, Today, I glue all my face frames on cabinets a while ago, years ago. I used to put a brad in them, and, I, and that is what the brad would hold it until the glue dried. Um, I would do that with an 18-gauge brad. Um, these 23-gauge pinners are amazing because they are so tiny, and there's no head on the pins, that you really can barely see the hole they produce when you use them. So for something like molding on a cabinet, if you're going to pin that in place, um, those 23 gauge pinners are amazing because they're even in the absence of wood dough or any kind of filler, they're nearly invisible. Um, they're nearly invisible just as they are. So they're very, very useful to have. That being said, they shoot a really small pin, so they don't have the bite. They don't have the grip that like an 18 gauge Brad would have. Staplers. Um, when I'm putting a back on a cabinet, I most commonly staple that on. And the reason is that with real thin materials, like a quarter inch plywood back, um, if all you do is a brad or a pin, the head is so small that with that thin material, it can literally just pull past the head of the fastener. Where with a crown stapler, with a stapler because it's got a crown because it's shaped like, shaped like a U, like a staple, that crown will have a much better fit on the, or not a much better fit, a much better grip on that thin material. It's much more likely to hold it in place for a long time, forever. So what I would do, I guess, you know, it's like, um, it's like a lot of different, um, it's like a lot of different tools. When you have the need for one of those, get the one, and then don't be surprised if in your future woodworking, you're gonna have a need for another one, and another one, and another, and, you know, and eventually you'll probably end up with, with all three. Um, but it's, um, it, yeah, it's just, a, it's just such a big, it depends on what you're doing, um, which one is gonna get called for first in your shop. So, um, Andy is saying he does furniture repair. If I could see a picture of the broken chair, I could probably make a suggestion. Could I put my email here? So sure, if if Andy, if you want to make your email available, and I'm going to go back up and find. Where was that? Oh, so then for Manish, who asked the question, um, 
Andy is on www.goa.com. I think, Manish, you are not, because it looks like Katie brought your question in. So you need to get on wgoa.com, look at the live stream there, get in the chat roll here, and he'll post his email, and then you two can go, um, you two can communicate back and forth independently there. Scrolling, lost my place a little bit. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a brief commercial timeout because um, we've got a cool thing coming up that um, we've done before. I just referenced the last one we did, this product showcase that we do. This will be, I think, the third one that we're doing. Um, so what's neat with this is that we get products here in my shop. And then uh, one of my contributing editors, who's also a good friend of mine, Paul Mayer, will come to that event. And we stand and we, we go through each of those products live. And that's an opportunity for you to ask questions about it. And then additionally, we shoot some video ahead of time. And um, that, that lets me put the tool through a few more of its paces because, of course, we have time constraints during the live stream. So um, the video that we do ahead of time, we can do more with the tool than we can compress the video and show you that as part of the live stream as well. So part of the reason I brought this up is I'm working on a pretty cool thing. Uh, I'm working with um, some different finishes and the particular one that we'll talk about on the product showcase is Aqua Coat. It's a water-based product, no surprise, based on the name. But um, there are tests that are done by a, a governing board of stuff that's made in industry. And those tests, when it comes to finish, say, so we want you to put this, 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 and this on this board, let it sit for 24 hours, and then clean it off and see what we have. And um, did it blemish the finish? What did it do? How did the finish react? So on this bench over here, it's, this is a throwback to my college chemistry days. Uh, it's, it's been fun to get to this part of the setup. Um, I've got finish on a number of different boards, and then I'm going to put stuff on each of them. Mostly it's acidic stuff. Um, I'm going to put stuff on each board, let it sit for 24 hours like it's supposed to, take it off, and then we'll see what effect that has. So um, if you're interested in learning the results of this cool science experiment, um, November 3rd, I think I said November 4th, November 3rd is the product showcase. And that's where we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about how that went and what happened. And, uh, it's going to be very cool. I'm really looking forward to, um, the showcase in general. It's always fun. And then that in particular, that aspect of it in particular is going to be very, very interesting. Jerry says, I'm building a bedside table with mitered corners so I can have continuous grain, modern look. I'd like to add decorative spine, splines. Um, best way to cut splines in a piece this large. So you could do this a couple of different ways. I don't, a bedside table doesn't strike me as being huge. I guess I'm thinking of the table top. Is that what you're talking about? Like four rails surrounding the top? So if that's the case, I mean, if you have like basically a big picture frame, you could make a jig that you could use on your table saw so that that frame is being fed on edge over the saw blade. I know I've got a mitered frame sitting here, so let me just grab it and then I can show you. If what we're talking about is a frame like this, but larger scale. So one way to do that would be make a jig for your table saw, two cleats like this at 45 degrees, fastened to a backer, and then we can run that over a table saw blade. Or if it's quite large, the other thing you can do 
is make a jig that would allow you, allow you to use a slot cutter and a handheld router. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's right. My slot cutter is right here. So for that to work, for the slot cutter to work, what you would have is, again, a, a board with a cleat at 45 degrees, a cleat at 45 degrees. So at the end of the day, we're, we're creating with those two cleats, we're creating a straight line. And the reason for that is the slot cutter has a ball bearing on it. So that bit can then ride on those boards acting like a fence and it'll cut through that miter giving you the space to put the spline in there. Um, so that would be, if it's too large to handle on a table saw, that would be take the tool to the work instead of the work to the tool. That would be a way to handle that. Uh, so Kevin asked and Katie is Katie on the spot and answered um, when the product showcase is. So uh, four o'clock central time, November 3rd. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, so Johnny says vinyl molding or PVC molding will close the gaps on a vanity that isn't square to the wall. So that's a good point. That's a way to, instead of looking at gaps, add a piece of trim that finishes that off. That's a good idea. So before we wrap up, don't forget to get your pumpkin tray plan. Um, just click on that where it says download now and you'll be able to download now, ironically enough. And you'll have that plan so that you can kick out a couple of pumpkin trays. And I would say my advice would be make more than one because they're very cute. And um, if people see one, they're gonna want it. And uh, you might as well just dive in and make a few of them at a time. Well, we have successfully answered all the questions that you have. So Katie, I think we can close out. And um, trying to think of what's happening next. Um, our next live stream will be second Thursday in November. Um, that one's going to be very cool. We're going to have a guest on that one, and it's going to be all about sawmilling. It's a good friend of mine. He's actually in Pennsylvania, and he's been running a sawmill business for eight years, been running a sawmill for 20 years. Um, and we'll talk about cutting lumber, drying lumber, different types of sawmills. Is he actually going to be weather permitting? He's going to be outside his sawmill for that live stream. So you're not going to want to miss that. It's a great opportunity to ask about plain sawn versus quarter sawn, air drying lumber, um, all the stuff that goes along with converting logs to the stuff that we use every day in our shop. Um, all right. Thanks so much for tuning in. And we will see you next time. Katie, punch it out, please.